Humans have been telling stories for thousands of years, but we're just starting to tell stories in VR. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Seidenworm, and my job is to produce best of class narrative VR that has a social impact purpose. You know, narrative VR isn't the only way this tech is being used to improve people's lives. I, I, have, I have colleagues that are working on amazing things in education, health, and medical fields. But today we get to focus on social impact storytelling in VR, and it can change the world. VR for Good started about four years ago, and at first many of our projects were modeled after Gabo Aurora and Chris Milk's Clouds of for Sidra. It's a beautiful 360 video, and it was created in conjunction with UNICEF. It's narrated by a girl in a Jordanian camp, and she gives you a tour of the camp and tells you about her life there. It's sweet, and sad at the same time, but mostly it just makes you want to help her. Clouds Over Sidra was an effective fundraising tool for UNICEF, even though it lacked any of the traditional marketing heavy characteristics of a PSA. Gabo and Chris had hit upon a simple but extremely effective idea. Tell one person's story VR and the viewer can more personally and deeply relate to a global situation that might otherwise seem distant and too daunting to understand. We've seen many successful 360 projects that follow this form, but we're also seeing a, lot, seeing a lot of innovation in this idea lately. Today, we're going to talk about what's next for Social Impact VR and dive into a few projects that tweak the formula in fascinating ways. Our three panelists today are all people I love and admire. We have Sandra Bialystok, who is the producer of Home After War and is now head of partnerships at Alith Foundation. Celine Tricart, creator of The Key, Sun Ladies, a director of photography for multiple 2 and 3D projects, and an author. She literally wrote the book on VR. And Alton Glass, owner of GRX Immersive Labs and co-creator of In Protest and The March. Alton is a leader, mentor, and a strong voice for an inclusive VR community. So let's start with you, Sandra. Can you please tell us a little bit about Home After War and how it came to be? Sure. Um, so Home After War, Amy, uh, was created through the Oculus Creators Lab, the VR for Good program, and the GICHD, the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining, brought the uh, NGO content side to the equation. The GICHD is an expert organization. It gives advice to countries on the best ways to remove uh, landmines and other explosive remnants of war from their land, according to international standards. And uh, we were partnered with Now Here Media, a production company in Berlin that brought the creative side to the equation. And together, along with the Oculus VR for Good, we wanted to tell a story that was, uh, that shed a light on, on an important and pressing issue. And reports were coming out from Iraq that uh, displaced Iraqis who were returning home were coming back to find that their houses had been booby-trapped. Booby-trapped by ISIS, um, who had left behind IEDs, explosive, ex um, improvised explosive devices, as they were retreating. So now here media, they traveled to Fallujah to find people and to listen to their story uh, so that we could create an experience around this uh, subject. And when they were there, they came across Ahmaid, a man who had come back to Fallujah only a few months before with his family. The experience is Ahmaid's story. They scanned his house, recreated it and in the, in, to become an immersive room scale experience. So when you're doing the experience, you're actually able to walk through his house, explore it at will. And as you're walking through, Ahmaid appears to you and he tells you his tragic story. We created this experience, of course, to create general awareness amongst the public, but really, perhaps more importantly, to pinpoint, uh, to, to target policymakers, to let them know that IEDs were a real threat, that they were mm. targeting civilians, and that it was a, it was a topic mm. that needed uh, international uh, the international eye. 
We previewed it at international film festivals, and now it's uh, on the Oculus Store, so lots of people can download it. Thanks to everybody who has seen it and who have left messages because they've been very encouraging and supportive to this point. So Home After War showed at 15 or so international festivals and was also installed in the lobby of the UN headquarters in New York. Um, how did reactions differ between your festival goers and your policymakers? So generally, um, everybody comes out of the headset emotional. It's a very poignant story. It's a human story. And people reacted in that way. After, I'd say that the uh, festival-going audience was really glad that, we, that they found out about this, because oftentimes they didn't know this was going on. While the policymakers, I think the common universal message from the policymakers was, everybody needs to see this piece. I agree. So speaking of festivals, let's see the trailer, teaser trailer Celine created for the key for its premiere at Tribeca Film Festival. Oh, hello. I wasn't expecting you. I don't usually have many visitors. My name is Anna. I'm having trouble remembering my past, but I keep having dreams about it. And in every one of them, there's this mysterious key. I want to remember where the key comes from and what it means. Can you help me? Celine, what what is going on in this trailer? What's tell us about it? <laughs> Yeah, so what you saw was in fact the release trailer for The Key. And as you can tell, we don't reveal much in this trailer. All you need, all you know really is that there is a young woman named Anna that she doesn't remember her past and she has very vivid dreams. And in every one of her dreams, there is a mysterious key, right? So when you start the experience, that's all you know. And when you put the VR headset on, you are basically projected into her dreamscape. And so you will be going through multiple of her dreams. In the first dream, you find yourself in what we call a cloud house, a house in the clouds, and you find um, three little, very cute uh, creatures, companions. Uh, but suddenly a storm hits and destroyed, destroys the cloud house. And, and one of your companion is taken away from you. And as you go from dream to dream, they get uh, darker and darker and in every dream you're faced with a challenge and you're losing or you have to sacrifice uh, one companion after the other. So when you reach the end um, of, of, of the dreams, suddenly the environment around you that so far looked like animation, uh, watercolor style, dissolves and transforms into an ultra-realistic uh, photogrammetry scan of a, a destroyed house in, in West Mosul in Iraq. And that's when you realize that Anna was in fact a um, refugee from a war zone and uh, that this key that she keeps dreaming about is in fact the key of her lost home. And she will never go back to this home, uh, but she can't let go of the key. And this was in fact uh, inspired by um, lots of stories of refugee who for most of them, even though they will never be able to go back home, cannot let go of that, that key. The, so that's how the story started. And so that's why we build this giant metaphor, really, for what it is to, uh, to, to be a refugee and going through the ordeal from uh, dream to dream, which are all metaphors of a specific uh, event in the life of a refugee. Uh, yeah, that story about people keeping their keys to homes that are destroyed or that they will never mm -hmm. see again just kills me every time. Um, this is probably a good time to mention that all of these experiences are available now for free in the Oculus Store, now that In Protest just launched on Oculus TV. Alton, you've been involved with multiple projects focused on racial justice recently, including the March your powerful reenactment of the March on Washington and in protest, which is all about the people behind the protest moment, movement that is going on right now. What's so special to me about in protest is that it's a reflection of history as it's being made. Can you talk a little bit about your vision for the project? 
Yeah, it's um, the the uh, hitting back to what you said about history in the making. You know, you have uh, filmmakers who are now uh, being able to use some of the new immersive technologies to get out there and capture some of the same stories uh, that, you know, the civil rights leaders uh, captured during the 63 March on Washington. So now you have uh, this coming full circle all over again in 2020. And they're able to use uh, the goal is to be able to use some of these new immersive technologies to do what they did back when they uh, really moved the civil rights movement forward, which was their goal was to be able to share light on what was happening uh, to the rest of the world, not just America, but around the globe. And what that did was it, it rallied people to take action. And I think with immersive technology like VR, it's allowing us to now take you uh, on the front lines if you can't be there. And it's really to be able to inspire you and show you that, look, you know, there are people out there who are protesting in various different ways. Uh, you may not be able to actually get out there on the front lines and protest, but there are different means that you could take to contribute, helping push uh, and using your voice. And that's what um, the pro in protest is about, about the individuals that are the unsung heroes and showing that everyone's voice is significant in protesting and being able to create opportunities for change uh, together as we unify. And uh, VR is just a great tool for that, for, for individuals who can't actually get out there on the grounds as a result of COVID right now, uh, to show you that, you know, anything is possible by, you know, connecting with each other and, and unifying to uh, protest. Yeah, there's a lot of way to, ways to support the folks out there and not the most obvious one is actually being the face of a protest, but there are so many other people. Um, when you were making this project, um, Alton, and when you started shooting, you showed your subjects some of the rough 360 footage that you had captured from other protests, just rough stuff in headset. How mm -hmm. did how did that help the process for you? Did it make the interviews different, do you think? Yes, it did. Uh, you know, the, we had a combination of individuals, and what was really fascinating was they all um, had their own form of protest. Some were actually on the on the grounds and some were not on the ground. So being able to share some of the VR experiences from different cities, because it's a four part series that takes place in Minnesota, um, Atlanta, Los Angeles. Uh, we have footage from, you know, Portland and various different cities. So they were able to actually get on the ground and experience protests from various different uh, perspectives and locations through different movements. And uh, when they came out of it, it really, really gave them, a, a, it grounded them in a, in, a, um, in a moment to be able to speak as if they were there in a sense, right? They were like really, really fired up and they dove right into the moment uh, because they could feel what was happening at that moment. And one of the uh, one of our subjects said, wow, you know, this really, really, uh, even though I, I, I am in Minnesota, uh, I was able to experience things that I hadn't seen yet taking place in my own city. And it really brought me back to a place that really fired me up to why I do this every day. So so it, it, it really put them in a the moment uh, with their interviews. Uh, so it was really, really helpful. And, uh, you know, thank you for that collaboration tip as well. I and mean, it was really awesome. Cool. Yeah, it's interesting. You think about VR taking you somewhere else, but sometimes it's just as important to take you out your door into your neighbor's perspective or, or something like that. When you were, when you were showing this to the, your subjects, was it um, ever somebody's first time in a VR headset? Yeah, actually several, um, you know, there were several uh, people who it was their very first time going in VR and, you know, they were really blown away at, at one, you know, just the way it made them feel. Um, and then again, it gave them a connection to other places that they have not, actually seen the movements take place yet. So you, in a sense, you feel uh, connected in a way to all the other people that are out there on the grounds and, and, and it inspired them to continue to keep their work going, you know, back in their city. So uh, it was really awesome. Cool. Similarly, Sandra, as, as I recall, while we were making Home After Work, very few or maybe none of your colleagues understood really what you were doing or why and you really needed to be kind of a, a VR evangelist within your organization. How did that go? What did you do? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like with Alton, um, you know, most of the people in my organization hadn't been a headset, hadn't done an experience um, with, for them, what I started with was I showed them clouds over Sidra, you know, what you were mentioning earlier at the, in the introduction that at the time was the, uh, the reference for this kind of VR piece uh, that, that brings forward an, an NGO um, or humanitarian message. As we went along in the development process, I did a lot of explaining about what we were doing, but it wasn't really until we were near the end of the build that I that they saw that my colleagues got to saw what we had been making. They had a lot of faith in us, and they were they 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 were blown away. They were blown away by the story, but they were also really uh, moved by the by how VR like Alton said, transports people to a different place and the power of the medium to tell a story. Cool, thank you. Celine, you on the other hand are a VR vet, but, but the key was your first interactive piece, right? So yes, how did you design the interactivity so that it served the story instead of getting in the way of the story? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, Despite the fact that it was my very first interactive game engine based experience, uh, after many years doing a cinematic VR 360 videos, um, I'm a gamer, <laughs> tall nerd here, um, and I love video games. And I think right now we are living the golden age of video games and some uh, of my main source of inspiration for storytelling in the past five years have been indie games. Um, so taking from, uh, from, from what video games have achieved of uh, crafting interactivity and uh, the apparent agency that you have as, as a player into powerful emotional stories, um, that's, that's how um, I crafted the key in a way. So for example, my very first the very first thing I decided was that even though I'm a gamer and I'm very comfortable with all the controls and the buttons and all that stuff, I decided very early on that we would not going to be using any button really on the hand controllers, for example. I, my, my, I set the bar so that my grandmother could experience the key and be okay, right? And so nothing in the design of the experience should come in the way of, of of that immersion and emotional state that you're in and i believe that for virtual reality we, we talk a lot about storytelling um but i believe that it's more um story living right so we craft a world and then we craft maybe the, the rules of this world but then we have to take a step back and let the participant uh make their own journey. And so when designing an interactive experience, uh, I believe in, in the process of trusting our participants to, 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 to find their way and not being too, um, uh, driving them too much into the direction we want them to go. Gotcha. Wow, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we talk, a lot about making VR comfortable on a broad scale. And as creators, I know you all take great pains to make sure that your experience is as physically comfortable as possible. But that said, all of these experiences we're talking about today are designed to expose the viewer to a level of discomfort to get their story across. Um, Sandra, I know you had very specific debates about how far to go with the violence inherent to the message of Home After War. Can you talk a little bit about those conversations uh, that went on about that subject and, and where you landed? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, so, we, so there is a moment of violence in the piece. Uh, and the creators, uh, at, with now here, we talked a lot about, you know, do you make it a real explosion? Do you make it uh, sort of a metaphor of an explosion? And we went more on the, we, we took the art, more artistic experiential route rather than something that's that's real because it, it, done, it didn't seem necessary. It seemed over the top um, and gratuitous. 
So the experience at that moment is sensorial, but not, but not super alarming, I would say. But at the same time, we had to really make sure that the people who were doing the experience would be okay with it, right? Uh, so we did a lot of testing during the development stage of, of the experience. We tested people from all age ranges and sectors, specifically veterans, to see how they responded to, to the experience as we were creating it. Um, and then when it was ready to launch, uh, we, well, with you, Amy, and, the, and your colleagues at Oculus, we, were, we spent a really long time on writing an onboarding script uh, for, for the people who were going to go into the experience at the festivals or other events. We really wanted to make sure that they felt safe in the space, that they felt safe in the headset, that we warned them that there was going to be something that was shocking. Uh, the last thing we wanted to do was trigger PTSD or any other kind of anxiety. So uh, we really built up a, um, a lot of comfort in the exterior part of the experience be before people went in. Now that's been translated to uh, warning uh, when you download the experience. So it's really, it's, you know, at every step we've, we've tried to do our best to make sure that people are as aware as possible and as safe as possible. I think that's super important, and I'm really glad we went through that process. Um, Celine, the, the key is designed to be very mysterious. It's often intimidating, but it never feels unsafe. Uh, how did you strike that balance? Yeah, first of all, I, I agree with Sandra about um, disclaimers, uh, whether it's a title card at the beginning of the experience or and for the key, it was it's part of the voiceover at the very beginning, uh, where Anna, the character, tells you that uh, nothing can hurt you, uh, and nothing will hurt you, nothing will attack you. Um, I think this is important. I actually had uh, a very painful experience with my previous project, The Sun Ladies. That it happened once, but it, it really I remember it very vividly of uh, I showed the Sun Ladies to someone's uh, documentary about women fighter in Iraq and uh, I didn't know that the person was a vet and had PTSD and she had mm. literally had a panic attack uh, even though there is zero violence zero um, explosion uh, zero blood anything in, in the it's just the fact of being immersed in an environment that she recognized uh, trigger that panic attack. So I think we should all take this very, very seriously and, and, and be uh, mindful and respectful of our audiences. Um, in the case of the key, it was designed, we have to convey a certain, uh, a certain deal of, 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 well, difficult situation, right? Even though it takes place in a dreamscape and it's a metaphor, so it's not as traumatizing as the real thing, but so the way uh, I, 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 I crafted that event is that everything that happens doesn't happen to you directly. It happens to your, your little companion, so uh, non-player characters, NPCs. Um, so you are in charge of taking care of them and bad things happen to them. So we still create that uh, emotional journey, but the danger is not directed to you directly. directly. And that, that was a way uh, to avoid that uh, discomfort that you're talking about. Yeah, it still works really well emotionally, though, even if it's not gory or um, violent in the same way. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to be. <laughs> no. Alton, we've had a couple of enlightening conversations about racial justice and how discomfort is often necessary to create change. Where do you draw that line within in protest? Um, you know, discomfort, you know, I, I've lived it. I live it every day. So I think that one, the first most important thing is to just make sure you don't regurgitate trauma. Right. And I think there are some very interesting mechanisms that you can use in VR um, to sort of soften that, you know, sort of like the use of sound and different things you can do to allow the viewer to uh, paint the rest of the picture with their imagination. Right. Like we don't have to. Um, you know, show you everything, right? We, we, because that's the great thing about, uh, you know, VR is, you know, people see with their ears to a certain degree. So uh, we, we, that's one of the things we try to do. But in terms of uh, discomfort, I think you, you, you need a level of discomfort because that creates discourse 
uh, when, when you're working inside of a project and to be able to break someone from their comfort zone. I think that's the most important thing, because when you come out of that uh, virtual reality, you come back into your reality. And if I can now notice uh, a sort of pixel shift in my world and, and see something, I can now uh, uh, make it a point to say, you know what? Now I see what that feels like. Or I understand that. And I think that's, that's, that's very necessary uh, because, you know, going back to uh, the march, you know, they strategically staged to get the press out to see what was happening to them down in Birmingham so that the rest of the world could be uncomfortable with seeing that everyone is a human being. And I think that when people can understand and you look at people like Daniela Frazier, uh, the young woman who captured uh, George Floyd, that was very uncomfortable. And she created content that created discomfort for everyone to say, you know what, that's not how you treat a human being, no matter what they, they've done in life. And that sparked an entire protest that now has us out here rallying together to make sure that we're all on the same page protecting each other. So we need that level of discomfort. We just have to figure out how we calibrate it. Ah, thank you. Very insightful. Um, so I brought this group together because I love how different their experiences are and how they were created for vastly different purposes. Sandra, you published a paper about what you learned from Home After War. Can you Give us the highlights and talk a little bit about your factors for measuring success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, like everybody, you know, we wanted to know as much as we could how impactful the piece was uh, at, at a certain point in time. Uh, so I started uh, for this journal article I wrote, I started with what are usual social media metrics, ways of engaging, um, measuring engagement on social media. And then I kind of took it from there. So the first thing that I tried to measure was reach. And that uh, for a, a period of time was how many heads got into headsets at festivals, at other events, and um, and then I broke down the audiences by country, by language, that kind of thing to have a better idea of who, how many and who those people were. The next level was engagement. Um, once you've seen the piece, what we wanted to know is, what did you take anything away with you? Did you act in a certain way? Did you change something? The best way that we could measure that, because we can't measure change um, yet uh, is how many articles were written about home after war, uh, how many invitations the people who are on the lead team received to talk about it. And for me, engagement means that people took it on board, it affected them in a specific way, and they did something to put it out in the world so more people could hear about it. The last metric is action. And there were two ways that I was measuring action. The first was whether other organizations in the humanitarian world reached out to the GICHD or to Now Here Media to use the piece for their own purposes, awareness raising, fundraising, whatever. And the other was uh, uh, museums, uh, some museums contacted us to use the piece in their, in their exhibitions. That's how I put it out in the journal. Um, that seemed like the, a clear way at the time of measuring something that we're still figuring out. And, and in your measurements, were any of those three more important to your organization or were they all kind of part of a master formula? Yeah, I mean, I think they were all important, especially the reach was important, but, but Perhaps the most important of all, if I had to, if I had to say name one, would be the other humanitarian organizations. I think that really showed that other um, groups really found this to be a useful piece for telling a story. That it was a it was a persuasive form of communication, and also I think more importantly, it creates community around a specific cause. So it's fantastic if other groups want to use Home After War to help tell their story, it means that we're all behind on the same message. Great, thank you. Um, Celine, you killed it at festivals with the key. Winning, you won top awards at Venice and Tribeca and toured pretty much for a solid year um, around the world. How has the reaction been now that you're launched on Quest? I, it was, you just launched in April, correct? 
Yes, uh, mid-April. Um, it was actually very good. So I've, I was lucky enough to go with the key to multiple festivals and saw firsthand the reaction of the public. And it was often very emotional. Um, we uh, also were able to show it to some world leaders at the Doha Forum and, and also the Venice Film Festival. We had a couple of uh, politicians and ministers. Um, but it's, it's tough to define, um, like Sandra said, the, the notion of, of success, right? And in our case, for about the refugee crisis, there is 26 countries in the world welcoming refugees out of a total of 195. So uh, maybe a success for the key would be to raise that number to 27. I don't know. But that seems also very unlikely, right? So uh, a few years ago, I watched a documentary and it made me a vegetarian. Uh, maybe the goal of that documentary was to take down the meat industry. And it didn't, but I'm sure it changed the life of a lot of people. Maybe thousands of people became vegetarian like I did. So I, I really believe that maybe the success is uh, small changes, right? One human at the time. And that's the beauty of, of, of releasing on the Okuda store and on Quest and on Rift is that suddenly uh, lots and lots of people have access to it, were able to download it and watch it. Um, and I was, I was reading some of the reviews and we had like people saying, um, I didn't know what the story was about, uh, but at the end I was, I, I was having goosebumps and I, I won't forget it. Or we had another review that says, uh, you need to make sure you have extra time after the experience to deal with the emotion because it, it took me 20 minutes to be functional again. So those are like the little things, right? Again, one human at the time. Um, I talked to Brian Bollinger, the, the um, executive director of Friends of Refugee, our, our partner nonprofit for the key. And he told me that after uh, the premiere of the Tribeca Film Festival and over the course of, of last year, um, uh, Friends of Refugees saw a big leap into their web and social media engagement and also their fundraising uh, grew 18% uh, after the release of the key compared to the year before. Um, so those are all small things, but it all contributes to how we can define success for a social good piece. Mm. Baby steps. Uh, Alton, the first collection of in protest videos just dropped so we really don't know yet how people are reacting but what's your ideal response to the experience uh, bringing together community um, is very important uh, to be able to have these com these uncomfortable conversations and what they can collectively do community to, to community um, uh, one thing I love about it is too is it, it, it bridges to, together different generations so that's a goal. You know, like movies are still siloed, right? You know, you have different age groups to go see one movie, different age groups to see another movie. But with VR, you, what I love about it is you, you'll see generations come together in these VR experiences and start to have these conversations together about how they can continue to share that knowledge base, right? And equip the next generation with the tools as well to move forward with how they may change. So that to me is, is a, a great space um, and, and a great measurement and what we're hoping to be able to get. And, and, and last, most importantly, inspire other storytellers to dive into this medium and say, you know what? Wow, I can, I can go pick up a, a 360 camera if I need to. I can learn an Unreal or a Unity engine and go build me and start world building and sharing meaningful experiences. So um, for me, I, I meet a lot of um, people that get inspired by going out there and creating, and I hope to continue to keep that going. Amen to that. With this that. project. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's wrap it up. We're going to need to get to our, our uh, rapid fire round. So um, everybody, I'm going to ask you a quick question. I want like 15 seconds or less answer. Alton, if you could show in protest to anyone, who would it be and why? Wow. Um, next year, <laughs> a first time voter. First time voter. Um, so they Excellent. can see what it really means to take action with the power of their vote. Yep. Sandra, how about you? Who would you show home after war to? <laughs> um, uh, Prince Harry. I'd love Prince Harry to <laughs> see this. <laughs> it's true. 
I mean, he took the cause. He he took on the cause from from Princess Diana of the fight against landmines, and he's a vet. He knows this stuff. I would love to see him in a headset and see him after that. <laughs> I would just love to see him in a headset. Yeah, yeah, um, that too. <laughs> Celine, I know you didn't want to do any self-promotion here, so I'm going to do it for you. you. You went from having your first project at Venice Film Festival last year to being president of the jury this year, which is just amazing. Congratulations. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for the discussion today? Yes, thank you. Um, so this is a panel about um, uh, social good, VR. And so I guess this is not just for people doing social good project, right? Wh whatever project you are working on, if you're working on a movie, a video game, a VR experience narrative, uh, there is always room in your normal project to invite social good, right? So think about ways you can do so. Think about ways you can um, uh, tackle some difficult messages and think about how you can inspire your audience because you have an audience it's such a gift. And so invite social goods in, even if it's not a social good project. That would be my message. I, it's a great message. Um, I think that's a great place to leave it. Um, you know, what, what I'm learning from this conversation is, you know, often we gauge success of a VR experience by how widely it's distributed or how much money it makes. But what I, I think we're learning here is it's just as important that the who is just as important, the how is just as important as for, especially for social impact projects, how we're affecting people with the work um, and if they're the right people to, to see it. Um, just as social impact VR has been evolving, so has our VR for Good Experiences initiative. Um, and I just wanna let everybody know that we're going to be focusing on two areas we think need urgent attention between now and the end of next year. Um, the first is social and racial justice and in protest kicks off that theme. And then our other focus is mental health. And we're starting with a project called Goliath in conjunction with Anagram in the UK, and that'll be out next year. So if you are a developer and have pitches for experiences that touch on these issues, get in touch with me. Celine, Sandra and Alton, your stories are integral and important insights into the human condition. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Amy. You so much, Amy. Here's the teaser for In Protest to give everybody a taste of what we've been talking about. We get caught to a fire. I can see black smoke rolling out and you can see the people jumping out of windows on either side of the businesses. Right now, protest has somewhat of a different feel. The Village Project was a way for us to provide free resources to folks. Everybody was working together. It brings you right back to the camaraderie. Sweet Potato Pie spoke to me. It's the connection to the earth and definitely is a form of protest. Black Lives Matter is not a movement for me because I live it every day. It's about showing these kids, like, you mean something. I'm fighting for justice. Tears collapse on top of your skin like heavy rain. There is wailing all around you. <laughs>